Good morning, church. So happy to be with you guys this morning. Um, if you guys don't know who I am, my name is Logan Agartha, and uh, me and my wife, Nikki, we lead the campus ministry at the University of Oklahoma. And, you know, I, I'm just grateful uh, that, you know, Ben lets us uh, get up here and shares the stage with us. Uh, and I'm always, always happy to get up here and share uh, the Word of God with you guys. But before we dive into the Word of God, uh, I want to share some good news with you guys. So, uh, some of the campus got up here a minute ago, and uh, they did a wonderful job sharing, but we had the opportunity to go uh, serve in Missouri. So I've got a few pictures for you guys. Uh, but I did just want to say, you know guys, since me and Nikki moved here um, about the last three and a half years, uh, we have been constantly been given to uh, by other ministries. And this was the first time since me and Nikki have moved here that we have been able to go out and give to another ministry. And so this is just an incredible experience for us. Uh, up here we got a picture of the baptism. Uh, Sandra got baptized that night in the Missouri Church Building. It was a lot of fun. Some of our students reaching out uh, with the Dallas students. Um, one of the Bible talks we had over there, and then we even had like some arm wrestling competitions, I think. So... <laughs> Linda won, by the way, so represent. No, <laughs> no but I think it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a great trip for us, and we came back really encouraged. And on other news, this is my baby. She has uh, been a bundle of joy, uh, and she is 18 pounds now, so she's getting pretty big. She's like learning how to stand on things, sort of. Uh, and uh, it's just it's been fun watching her grow up, but. As you can see, uh, we've been eating a lot more food. We've been trying a lot of different things. And uh, her happy place is, is getting fed on her high chair. So she's a bundle of joy. Uh, uh, nothing but good news from the campus and the Agarda family. So, uh, but this morning, I want to talk about motivation. And so the title of my lesson is Deep Motivation. And, and today my hope is I want to be able to talk about where to find motivation when we feel like we don't have any. And I want to talk about how, how crucial that is to our walks with God, but also where that motivation might take us. Amen? Cool. So I want to start this morning with a story. All right. You guys probably have no idea who this guy is, right? If you guys don't know me, even if you do know me, you might not know. I'm a Miami Dolphins fan. I am a quiet Miami Dolphins fan, uh, but now that we have Tyreek Hill, I'm feeling a little bit better about sharing this on stage. So, <laughs> but uh, no, and so this guy's name is Bob Kuchenberg. Um, he played football uh, back in the 70s with uh, a solid Dolphins team fan. And uh, I was just looking at one of his stories. He had an interview. And in this interview, he's kind of telling this testimony of how he got to where he was. And he has a really interesting life story. What he told the interviewer is like, when I was younger, my father and uncle were human cannonballs at carnivals. He said, when I was young, my father told me, son, you have two choices. You can either be a cannonball or you can go to college. And he's kind of like, whatever, you know, it's family business. And then he said, then one day, my uncle got the cannonball. He came out of the cannon and he missed the net and he flew into the Ferris wheel. And he said, he ended up being okay. He said, from that moment on, I decided that I was going to college. <laughs> and, you know, I think about this, right, and uh, it's so funny. I think a lot of things in life will motivate us. There's going to be a lot of different things in life that motivate us. For him, it's, my, it's probably fear for his life, right? But I think this led him to choose to go to college, and that led to a lot of great things for this guy. He started playing football. He joined a team where they had an undefeated season. They were winning Super Bowls. Man, it, you know, it's, you're in a rough place when you got to share 50 years back to share about your football team. But, uh, no, it was good. I mean, and, and, and it's just funny because, you know, I think motivation can be something that's really powerful, regardless of what's motivating us, right? And, and you think about this, man, it helped this guy make a life decision like that. Like, it's, it's like his life decision. He's like, yep, I'm definitely going to college, right? But think about us, right? This motivation in general is a powerful thing. It's something that connects personal drive with emotion. 
It sparks passion with what we do. And on, on the other end, if we don't have motivation, uh, man, we can feel stuck. And I may not be the same as everyone here, but I have a love-hate relationship with motivation. Uh, and I'm either, I've got like two moods, man, when it comes to motivation. I'm either extremely motivated to do something, or I'm like not motivated at all to do something. And, and that, that, I've, I've done many things, like the same thing, while I've been motivated and while I've not been motivated. And let me tell you, it's two completely different experiences. And uh, the, my favorite one to, example to use is running. Uh, man, have you guys ever tried to run when you're unmotivated to run? That is like the worst experience I've ever had, man. And you think about what that experience is like, right? Usually a lot of complaining, right? Uh, and if no one's there to complain to, it's to yourself. You got a lot of negative thoughts. Why am I doing this? Why did I wake up to do this? Where am I even going? And you know, and there's like a lot of negative thoughts. But you think about if you choose to go on a run while you're motivated to go. What a different experience that is. The passion that you have for it, the joy that you can have, man, it makes whatever you're doing a little bit more enjoyable. You're driven to do something. And, and you know what? That's what I want to talk about today because this can be so important for our walk with God. Man, to just get this drive, this passion and joy and to enjoy the experience we have as Christians by being motivated to do what we do instead of just coasting on by. Amen? And so this morning, I want to take some time and I want to focus on something there will be a never-ending source of motivation for us as disciples. Amen? All right, turn your Bibles to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. This is Paul speaking. He says this. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and enmity, being hated and hating one another, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Christ Jesus, our Savior. So that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These, are, these things are excellent and profitable for everyone. And I love this verse. You might hear this verse spoken a lot at baptism, and this is because uh, Paul is describing our salvation. That's what he's doing here. And he talks about where we come from. He talks about being enslaved to the world, the way that we live, being disobedient, deceiving, uh, being enslaved by all kinds of passions, right? Living in malice and envy, hating and being hated. But because something happened, we have a shot at eternal life. And that one thing, the way it describes that something that happened is in verse 4, and I love it. He says, the one thing, he says, is that the kindness and the love of our God, of God our Savior, appeared. Because of the love of God, we now have a shot at eternal life. And my favorite part about this verse is what Paul says in verse 8. He says, stress these things. Stress the love and grace of God so that, why? It says, so that people will be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. You see, when you stress the love of God, it's a cause and effect. It affects our devotion to doing what is good. And that's such a big deal. Because what do we want people to do in this world as Christians? Good. <laughs> we want people to do what is good. If everybody did what was good, we'd have a lot of people going to heaven. And so this is something that I feel like should be really important to us. This idea, you know, to stress the love of God. So what does that mean? To stress the love of God. Excessive use constantly talking about it, pushing this idea, um, mentioning it in speeches when you're talking to people, thinking about it constantly. And Paul's telling Titus this. He's like, look, this is what will get people to do what is good. It makes me think about us. And, and, well, not just us, like the religious world in general. 
You know, we stress a lot of things. You know what? Sometimes we stress the Bible. Sometimes we stress what's right and what's wrong. Sometimes we stress that sin is bad. Sometimes we stress what a church culture should look like. I think these are all good things to stress. What, what Paul's saying here is like, if you want to get people to do what is good, if you want, to, if you want people to be motivated to do what is good, you've got to stress the love of God above everything. And my hope is, as we dive into this idea of stressing the, the idea of the love of God this morning, what, what you'll find is when you look at God's love, you'll find a deep motivation be better, to move, to do things, and to give back. And yourself, and you know what, the, the beautiful thing about it is uh, it's contagious, and when you're able to, to understand the love of God and, and live that out as well, you know, a lot of people will get behind that too. And so, um, a lot of you guys know me, uh, I, I'm a big music guy, so... I, 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 I love music, I, I love listening to music, I love playing music, um, and I got my bachelor's in music education. So music was a lot of my life uh, up until this, play, this moment. And I just want to share, there is a scientific connection between music and exercise. And uh, it, it, like study is scientific, like there's been a lot of studies about this. They've been studying the idea of the connection between music and, um, and exercise since like 1911. And you know, they, they had a lot of things, they found a lot of things throughout these studies. I think over a collection of like 60 studies, they had this uh, thing where they were, they were looking at people who were biking, they were looking at people who were running. And some of the things they came up with and, and just noticed what was, you know what, when people were listening to music, the participants exercising would tend to push themselves for longer periods of time. They would, re they would record lower levels of exertion. And this one, this one was kind of cool to me, but they would be in better moods even. Um, and you know, and, and when, when they're listening to music, the people would tend to exercise longer, but also the performance would get enhanced as well. People who are biking and running would, would do it faster and usually like they wouldn't even notice that they're doing it faster than they normally would either. And so like music, like when it comes to exercise, can be this great catalyst, uh, a great motivator for you uh, to just push yourself in a lot of different ways. And I can talk about music for forever, man. I can talk about music and movies. Like I think you talk about like when you watch, think about like your favorite motivational movie scene, man. And then you think about watching that scene with no music in the background. Different experience. I wish I could show you guys eight minutes of Rocky One, where, where it, you know that the training montage is playing like his theme song. It's a lot different. They have a video of it. It's a lot different when he's just running around and you just hear footsteps and a guy breathing really heavy versus like that heavy music playing. Anyway, I'm getting off topic now. But music can be a very powerful motivator, especially when it comes to exercise. I don't even. And I'm behind this, man. Have you guys ever been working out, listening to music, and then your phone dies? Or your music stops for whatever reason? And you're like, man, mid-workout, you're pumped up and stuff, and then, man, you're like, dang, I just lost all the motivation I had, man, in that, in that rep or whatever. And then you got to push it out. But uh, this is a scientific fact, right? But we're, we're not talking about science this morning. We're talking about God. And, and the biblical fact is that the love of God is what drives our walk with God. And the more you focus on how much God loves you, what he's done for you, what he's doing for you, the easier and more inclined you are to work out your salvation. But when you stop focusing on God's love and what he's doing and what he's done for you, you tend to slow down and things start to become a little bit difficult. And, uh, you know, we notice, and it's easy to see the need for motivation in a Christian's life, in a disciple's life, right? Because you think about the New Testament, right? In the New Testament, we are called to endure over 30 times. In the New Testament, we are encouraged to persevere over 20 times. We're called to be patient through suffering. You think about the story with Jesus and the persistent widow. We're called to keep on praying and to never give up. 
And you look at this stuff, and it's easy, it's easy to see that we need motivation in our life if we're going to walk with God. And that's why Titus says, guys, we've got to stress these things. We've got to stress the love of God. And so what I want to do now is I just want to look at someone who understood how to stress God's love. Sound good? Let's talk about the disciple John for a minute. John 13, John 20, John 20, 21. Here's a few examples. And I love this about him. It's John describes himself as the one whom Jesus loved. He says it often, but my favorite thing is he doesn't really describe himself in any other way. He didn't say the one who Jesus saved. He didn't say the one who Jesus commissioned. The one who Jesus called. He says the one who Jesus loved. That's how he identified himself. Loved by God. Is that how you identify yourself? And my favorite part is John writes so much about loving God in his letters. He's so good at expressing it. I want to look at some of that. So 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. And then we'll go down to verse 16. So verse 1 says this. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Down to verse 16. It says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And man, he's just so good at talking about God's love about stressing it with people, the people that he's talking to, right? And he, the, the descriptions he gets are so good. I love this one. Verse 1 is one of my favorites. It says, lavished with love. Meant to be fully covered. I think there's an extent of, a, of all of us I feel like we want to be lavished on. You know, just to be showered with love by somebody. Showered with, by being taken care of. It makes me, it reminds me of like a parent-child relationship. I've been, I've been, that's been growing on me in the last nine months, a lot more, so, but it's just this idea that, man, no matter what, no matter where we are, this constant showering of love, taking care of, and just looking to pour the love on one another, but my favorite part is how he specifically defines the love of God, and he defines it by what Jesus did on the cross. God defines it this way because he was a witness to the greatest moment of love in all of history. And when I read this verse, it reminds me of an old hymn. I don't know if anybody here is going to know it. Let me know if you do. But it's called, When My Love for Christ Grows Weak. I'm not going to sing it for you. But, but uh, there, here's some of the lyrics for this song. All right, you ready? It says, When my love for Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I see, then in the thought I go to thee, Garden of Gethsemane. And then later on in another verse, it talks about when my love for man grows weak. And in this whole idea of this hymn, it's like when my love grows weak, where do I go? I go to the cross. I think about that for me, I'm like, man, that is so true. When I feel a lack of motivation, or a lack of drive, when I feel disconnected from God, if I go read the cross, the story of what Jesus did for me, I immediately have conviction and motivation. And you know what, it's so funny, and I, I say this a lot, but man, every single time I sit through the Bible study series that we go through with people and lead the cross study, it could be three times in one week. Every single time I sit down and do that, I leave more encouraged, more challenged, and more uh, feeling more love than I ever had before. I feel like I just need to be better every time I go through that, understanding what Jesus did for me at the cross. And But that's how God's love is defined. It's, you know, love is not defined by the means of this world. It's not defined by... Uh, the pictures of Disney, it's not defined by Hallmark. Love is defined by what happened at the cross. Love is selfless. It involves sacrifice. It's about others more than it's about yourself. And that's exactly what God and Jesus did. He wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about us. Go to 1 John chapter 4. He keeps going. 
Verse 19, it's a short one. It says, we love because he first loved us. And the only reason I like this one so much is because it shows us that God's love requires a response. It says, God loved us first. And because of that, we love him. Guys, what is your response to God's love? Is it, hey, thanks. <laughs> Mosey on about our day. Or is your response to love God back? If God says, I love you, what are you saying back, man? We have to love God back. Amen. And if you go back up to verse 8 here, it's not the only thing, the only way that he calls us to respond either. John talks about it even further. Verse 8. It says, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, what do we do? We also ought to love one another. Lincoln said it well up here in communion today. Man, God's love compels us to love other people. And that's what John is appealing here. Look, he says, he says, since God has loved us so much by the cross, by sending his son, we ought to love other people. And you know what? It doesn't say love others because they're being nice to you or because they're good friends to you. It says, no, God says, because I love, you love. It has nothing to do with the other person's attitude or who they are or where they're at in life. He's like, because I love, you go love. It's all about who God is. Let me ask you guys this morning. Do you love other people? And I love this because John really knew how to stress God's love. And we see that through these letters. I mean, he, we're lavish by it. He's describing it in great detail. He, he, he brings us to the cross. The ultimate form of love was when Jesus went to the cross. He says that we need a response to his love. We need to love God back. We need to love other people back. His books are covered with this stuff. That's how you stress love. Are we doing the same in our lives? You know, he's not the only one that stresses love. So does Jesus. You know, and I think about one of the, one of the most popular uh, stories I feel like in the Gospels is the Good Samaritan. Right? And that whole story starts with the guy asking Jesus, what's the greatest commandment ever? And he goes, love God, love neighbors. That's literally what John has been preaching this whole time that we're just reading. He's like, look, he's, he's advocating here. He's like, look, we need to love. He's great at stressing the love. And he goes into even further detail. And he starts telling uh, this guy how to love your neighbor uh, when he asks, right? And he, and he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. A guy, you know, a few guys walk along a path. They see a guy beaten half to death. A priest, a Levite, they walk right past him. They don't help him, but the Good Samaritan stops. And I love that story because it's like, man, you, you think, you, you think you would ask yourself, why, why does he stop the helpless guy? And Jesus literally leaves no room to think anything other than the fact that he just, it was out of love. Nothing else. But I look at a story like that, and I'm like, man, if you're not living like that, willing to help somebody on the side of the road when it seems inconvenient, or maybe when it seems scary, if you're not binding up somebody's wounds, if you're not spending time or your own money even, to just help somebody. I can't help but think that we might be missing love. And I think about the other guys that didn't stop for a minute, and that challenges me. If I'm not sharing my faith, if I'm not helping someone know Jesus, if I'm not helping the poor, it's not because I'm too busy. I'm sure that was their excuse, maybe. Because I'm not loving. 
And John, Jesus, a lot of people in the Bible, they stress this a lot. And that's why love is so important throughout the whole Bible. Because we have to stress the love of God. Amen. And so love motivates us, right? It's a great motivator. And it motivates us to love back. To love God, to love other people, but what else? And I want to close the sermon today by talking about one more person. And I feel like I can't talk about motivation without talking about this person. And this person is Paul. Man, one of the most motivated people I've ever met in my life. Just, just listen to a few of these verses. The way that Paul uh, shows us uh, how he's motivated. Acts 20:24 20, says, this is all Paul speaking. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Romans 15, 19. From Jerusalem all the way to Elycrium, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. It's a lot of personal favorites here. 1 Corinthians 9, this is the one. Verse 26, it says, Therefore, I do not run like someone running in the I do not fight like a boxer beat in the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Man, talk about a driven individual. I beat my body. I make it my slave. I do not want to be disqualified. Where does this drive come from? Why is Paul so driven? Spoiler alert comes from love. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 15. For, sorry, verse 14. It says, For Christ's love compels us. That's it right there. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who has no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you now, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Amen. And we're thinking about this right here. What, what else does love motivate us to do? And that's what Paul talks about, man. The motivation comes from the love of God. He's compelled by the love of Christ. How is Christ's love compelling you right now? And for Paul, there's a lot of different, there's a handful of different things that you can see here. I think he, there's a lot of good little gold nuggets. I'll go through a couple real quick just because I feel like some are too good to pass up. But man, he, he spends a minute when he's talking about Christ's love compelling us. He talks about compelling us to die. That's a weird thing to say out loud. But, I mean, he has this moment where he, he talks about those who die with Jesus. It's not an uncommon thing in the Bible. I think he talks about it in Romans 6 too, to die with Jesus, to die to the old self. This old way of life, to crucify that life. Love should cause us to get rid of this life. Being ruled by sin 
is no longer. We have to be compelled to die to our old self. Guys, is love motivating me right now to fight sin? Is love motivating you to die to your old self? My favorite part is, it talks about being compelled to live also. It's not just about dying to your old self. Man, you you got to be proactive. He calls us to live. He says, we have to live. The way that he tells us we have to live is, is for the one who raised us. And I love the way it says this. It's like the old is gone and the new has come. We're new. How are you guys currently living for Christ? This one's my favorite. It also compels us to speak. And man, we're reading a lot of the cross this morning. But it compels us to speak. And it talks about being ambassadors for God. The way that God chooses to work through us. And he talks a lot about this ministry of reconciliation. What that is, is you know, it's turning enemy to friend, right? It's this, it's this peacekeeping mission. And he talks about us. We go out into the world and we're trying to make peace between God and man. And when you understand the love of God, you will be compelled to speak. We need to reconcile others with God, this peacemaking mission. And, you know, and every person that you interact with, man, God can use you. You have an opportunity to be an ambassador for Christ. And the, the campus is probably tired of me speaking about that. So we've been talking about sharing your faith for a very long time. Lastly, the very last thing I'll talk about here is uh, just being compelled to respond. And I feel like that's so convicting, that little last part here in chapter 6. It says, don't receive God's grace in vain. Man, that's possible <laughs> to receive his grace in vain. All this love that everything that Jesus did could be in vain if we don't respond to it. That's scary. How are you guys responding to God's love? You know, all these beautiful passages we've been reading, the depth of Christ's love, is that going to make a difference to you? I believe this love is too great for us to ignore. It demands a response. Amen? And, and then lastly, just the last thing he throws out there is so good. He says, now is the day of salvation. It doesn't say tomorrow. And, and my hope this morning is, I just wanted to share this with you, Man, we really are just talking about the cross a lot today, which is great. I love the cross. It's very convicting to me. It makes me feel loved. It makes me feel challenged. I'm sharing this with you guys because, man, I have been challenged. And I, I, I feel motivated right now. I have been this last week. And, you know, I, I shared about this swap being a great experience for our campus ministry. The swap was a great experience for me personally. You know, uh, Ben got up here and he shared a little bit about somebody named Davion Hamlin. And a lot of you guys know him, some of you guys might not know who I'm talking about. He used to serve here in the campus ministry, and uh, he ended up baptizing me back when I was on campus. And he raised me to be a disciple. He helped me walk through a lot of hard-headed moments in my life. And so he has a very special place in my heart, and no matter how far he moves away, he does not stop convicting me. And you know what? I, I, I felt so convicted. We got to go and hang out. And you know what? I just got to see the life of Davion. I got to see Davion be with his two children. I got, to, I got to see him interact with his children as a father. I got to see Davion interact with my ministry. And I got to see Davion interact with his wife at home. And you know what? Davion didn't try to convict me. He doesn't even know but just because I saw him choosing to love the way Jesus would, to love his wife like God loved the church, choosing to love his children and lavish them with love, to love the people that came to serve to Missouri, my own ministry that came up, God's ministry, to love those people, man, it was so motivating to me. I left that trip. I was like, I have to come home, and I have to be a better husband. I have to be a better 
father to my child. It made me want to spend more time with my child than I have been. It made me want to go home and do the dishes right when I got home. <laughs> but you know, I'm grateful for Dave Young because it reminded me that the love of God is a powerful motivator. And I hope that you guys can do that too. So I don't know where you're at today. You might be just starting your relationship with God. And if you are, I want to encourage you Take some time to focus on God's love because it'll help you take your first step. You might, be, you might be feeling stuck this morning with motivation. And I want to encourage you to refocus on God's love this morning and let it drive you. And you know what? Some of you guys might be running this race, giving blows to your body. And to you guys, I'll say, let the love of God with the music in your ears that helps drive you to keep going. Amen? Thank you, guys.